Uh, our speaker today is one of us. Tom Palmquist has worked really hard, and his history lends itself to what he's about to talk about, which is Christian nationalism, which we all know is a nasty little thing that's invading our society. And so Jim has the nitty gritty on uh, Christian nationalism. Thanks. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, I don't know if I, you'll see, maybe the tomatoes will come out later, but anyway, thanks for the applause. I do want to make sure you all know that we have a, I have a guest in the room here, and that's Jennifer Swan over here, and she and I had a nice coffee here a few weeks ago, and uh, we're going to do some collaborating together. Jennifer, thanks for coming out. Oh, we're really you. glad to have you here. This is Lehigh Valley Humanists. Ah, so, um, one other small thing, AARP likes to give flower arrangements when people pass away, and our uh, deceased, uh, um, Joyce Jackson, we're going to get a gift from AARP in lieu of flowers for the Lehigh Valley Humanists, so that'll, we'll see that happen, what happens there. Okay, um, so again, I'm Jim Palmquist. I think it's, I'm well, well enough known. Um, this talk uh, comes out of uh, some work that we've been doing. About a dozen of us have been getting together in what we call the new initiatives. We've met four or five times over the last nine months. And we said three things. One is we'd like to grow Lehigh Valley Humanists. Two, we'd like to fight Christian nationalism. And three, we'd like to diversify Lehigh Valley. I'd like to diversify Lehigh Valley Humanists. And we've worked on growing LVH to some extent. And we've also worked on fighting Christian nationalism. And this is the next step in that effort to bring everyone up to speed. Some of you have read widely on it. Some of you have been to the movie that I'll talk about later. There's a good movie on this subject. Um, and so my talk today is to uh, give you some more background on it. The strategy is I'm going to be talking about, um, I guess I can give myself a copy. memorize it, but you'll get a flavor. And, and oh, by the way, this script is available if you want to give your email address. I'll actually send you the script so you can refer to it if you like. And I also have a handout we'll get to later. Into the mic, Jim. OK, got to be in the mic. <laughs> all right. Do so I have to restate all that? Thank you, Trish. I'll tell you, I, I have a helicopter pilot. We're notorious for being able to do three things at once. But today, I'm not doing so well. Maybe I'm getting rusty. But anyway, so my talk today is primarily around a book by a lady um, uh, on the right, Catherine Stewart, and this is the front cover of the book. It's called The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. It was written in 2020. Um, I actually met her at a Freedom From Religion Foundation conference. I sat at her, she sat at my table, and I said, you're Catherine, right? She, she is. I hadn't read the book, so I didn't have any astute things to say to her. But anyway, so she's around. Um, she was raised, uh, she was uh, a Jewish, her husband is Catholic, and she's a, a, an atheist today. Um, this is her fourth book, and she did a lot of research showing up at, at Christian nationalist events as a news person, as a, as a news reporter, um, and they told her a lot of stories, and I'm gonna tell you a lot about that uh, in the next few minutes. Um, speak up if you have a question. I do have a good 45 minutes or more of content, but speak up if you have a question, we'll keep moving. All right. I thought I'd start by trying to define Christian nationalism. There's a lot of ways of defining it. Um, and here's my own thought on it. Christian nationalism is a political movement using church structures to advance a political agenda that refutes Christian teachings. The Christian nationalism will tell you that. But that's actually what's going on. And to some extent, the term Christian nationalism is a slur because uh, a lot of Christians would say, we don't agree with the Christian nationalists at all. Um, for our agenda, I'm not unhappy with that uh, because it, is, it does undermine Christianity, and I do believe it's destroying Christianity, actually. Christianity's not going to disappear, but this movement is going to continue to crush Christianity as I see it. Um, the next definition comes out of the jacket of the book, and that is the religious right is masqueraded as a social movement preoccupied with a number of cultural issues such as abortion and same-sex marriage. And Catherine Stewart reveals a disturbing truth. This is a political movement that seeks to gain power, 
and impose its vision on all of society. Not that great, huh? Not that great. Um, some more definitions of Christian nationalism. Christian uh, nationalism is a political ideology and a cultural framework that tries to merge American and Christian identities. And, and in other words, Catherine has gone through hundreds of interviews and you know, years of research, and she's taken a lot of information. And not every Christian nationalist, nationalist is going to agree with everything I say today, but a lot of them do, and that's why she put it in her book. Um, what Christian nationalism suggests is to be a real American, one must be a Christian. And not just any kind of Christian, but a Christian who holds certain fundamentalist religious beliefs that are in line with conservative political positions. And by merging American and Christian identities in this way, it creates second-class citizen status for anyone who doesn't fall into the narrow category of who fully belongs. Christian nationalism also, also often overlaps with white supremacy and racial subjugation. Though I will say this, add to that, they're moving into African-American and Latino communities very aggressively, and they're realizing they can't really have a movement of white supremacy without having a lot of black people and a lot of Latinos and, and people of color uh, involved in it. I don't understand that. Yeah. I, I don't understand what? What? why they would be moving in the communities. Their, their history is white supremacy, yeah. but the demographics are terrible for white people. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're a shrinking part of the population and there's a lot of Latinos and African Americans, other people of color who are religious and they need their votes, they need their involvement uh, to keep their movement going. You with me on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so good, good it, question. It just seems yeah. strange. <laughs> yeah. So white supremacy, I'm saying, is very much hidden today. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the mind, it's where they came from, but it's not, right. uh, so they can't win. Christians yeah. Yeah. I know in particular, there's, there's a group that exists, a religious group that exists between Allentown and Bethlehem in uh, an evangelic, evangelic, evangelical church that is uh, very diverse racially. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it, is, it is something that's happened. Yeah. And we, I think we all know the black community has really been supported by the church and is really engaged in the church very much. More, maybe more than the white community. I'll try and not step off the pier here and kill myself. Today. Okay, so then uh, uh, most of my material is coming out of the book that I mentioned, but this is coming from another source. Um, Christian nationalism is not the old time religion of the rural preacher and his flock. Christian nationalism is a virulent, well resourced, and relentless mutating political theology that is bigger than whiteness, we've talked about, bigger than piety, bigger than evangelicalism, and bigger than just church goers. And again, they're effectively appealing to black and Latino conservatives. That comes from a guy named Jeff Charlotte, who uh, wrote some books on the subject. Um, let's see, one of the things um, uh, that she says in her book that this this story is not really a story of evangelicals, even though a, a core of their constituency is evangelicals. Um, it includes many people that identify as evangelical, but excludes many evangelicals too. And it includes conservative representatives of a variety of Protestant and non-Protestant religions. Christian nationalists do not represent all Christians. In fact, some of the most powerful resistance to Christian nationalism may ultimately come from those who identify as Christian themselves. You can imagine that the Christian nationalist movement could be undermined by other Christians, uh, significant other Christians. Again, as I said, I believe Christian nationalism is damaging Christianity and will continue to do so. Um, and there's an organization formed called Christians Against Christian Nationalism, formed in 2019. And you can go on their website and find them. You can sign up, and they want a lot of data, your address and phone number, and they want to know if you're a Christian or not, because I don't think they're going to take. I didn't sign up because I couldn't check the box. I'm, I'm a Christian. Yes. And this is founded by the 
a Baptist joint committee uh, for, I forgot, I had the name, I'll come up with the name later, but it's actually a Baptist organization. It's not Southern Baptist, but the rest of the Baptist denominations have formed a joint committee that's quite famous. So, okay, let's talk about some of the beliefs that are in Christian nationalism. And I'm going to go through a dozen of these, and there's too many probably, but I think I'll still give you a feel for it. Um, these are the things that Catherine Stewart discovered going to conferences and meeting and hearing speakers and <coughs> Christian nationalists intend to dominate every aspect, aspect of life in America from government to education to the economy according to their religious principles. So it's a very broad-based movement. Some of their leaders tell their people that the basic patriotic action step is to vote biblical values. Yeah. So this is one of the things they'll do in elections. I'll talk more about elections in a minute, but voting biblical values is a key issue in their, in their minds. Yeah. <laughs> Their dream bill, this is the dream bill in Congress, allows individuals, nonprofits, private businesses, and government agencies to discriminate against targeted groups with impunity and above all without losing their tax exempt status, provided that they do so in accordance with sincerely held religious beliefs. <laughs> so if you have sincerely held religious beliefs, they want bills in Congress to say that you're protected with those beliefs to discriminate against other people. And of course, you know this is already going on. This on already the exists. Supreme Court, yeah. Yeah, well, uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the one is the cake baker case. He's, he's a yeah. cake baker. Yeah. He does custom cakes for, dis, for designs. A gay couple comes in. He says, I don't believe in homosexuality, so I'm not going to do it. Well, the, the Colorado government, the Colorado judicial system, our political system says, oh, you're discriminating against gay people. You can't do that. The case gets to the Supreme Court. He doesn't win, but he doesn't lose. The Supreme Court says, instead of saying this is discrimination that we've widely agreed, you can't discriminate against people, the Supreme Court says is the, the uh, group in Colorado that prosecuted him took advantage of the, the, the uh, ignored his religious sensitivities and they didn't find for him, but they didn't find against him either. So the second case is Elenis, Creative LLC versus Elenis. A lady says, I'm gonna set up a website for gay people to have marriage ceremonies on webs and stuff, on the internet and that kind of stuff. I'm not in business, but I don't wanna offer my services to LGBT people. I don't wanna do that, because I have sincerely held religious beliefs, and she won. Now, this case never should have been before the Supreme Court because it did not exist as a business. It was a thought of a business, and they were, she was allowed to discriminate against LGBT people because of her sincerely held religious beliefs. So, I mean, this is their dream bill, but this is what they're actually doing today, unfortunately. We'll talk more about beliefs of Christian nationalists. They put particular emphasis on the intersection of money and education, and this Hostility has its roots in the combination of racial animus and fears of secularization. I'll, I'll tell more about this in a minute, but a lot of this comes out of private schools in the South. They didn't want to have integrated schools, so that as soon as the board, Brown versus Board of Education came, they set up their own schools, and they want to make sure they're, they're religious schools to keep black people out, maybe poor people too but they also fear secularization because they think this public school system tends to secularize people. And it, it, we don't do it intentionally, we just don't allow religion to be taught in public schools. And of course, they, they want uh, money and education. They want it, we'll talk more about this in a minute, about how they want more money in, private, in their educational programs in their religious schools. Yeah. Here's what they say the Bible says. And I'm just gonna rush through this because you're, you're gonna actually fall off your seat when you hear this, I think. <laughs> um, the scripture, they say, that some of them say, the scripture opposes public assistance to the poor as a matter of principle unless the money passes through church coffers. Oh, of course. Whatever have the welfare, right? God has challenged believers to help the poor and widows and orphans, but he expects the government to step aside. Another one that they believe, some of them believe, the Bible votes against environmentalism, yeah. which is the litany of the green dragon and is one of the greatest threats to society in the church today, environmentalism. 
There is no convincing scientific evidence for human contribution to greenhouse gases is causing dangerous global warming. This is what they believe. The Bible, they believe the Bible opposes gun regulation. Gun yeah. They believe the Bible tells us it's, well, same-sex relationships are an abomination. I guess we can see, can see are that. From, are these all from her book? This comes from her book. These are people she's interviewed and speakers she's heard and books she's read. And she did years and hundreds of interviews. She did a lot of uh, showing up. At Be and she became well-known at Christian nationalist events. I don't know if they knew she was going to write a book about it. But. <laughs> Some say the Bible does not want women to have access to comprehensive 21st century reproductive medical care. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> right. God's word says he frowns on illegal immigrants. What? <laughs> yes. Some of their leaders say God believes in deregulation. Leaders must incentivize individuals and industries, which includes unencumbering them from unnecessary burdens of government regulation. Yeah. This is wild. Yeah. These are wild people, yeah. as far as I can tell. And then another one, uh, some of their leaders say, servants be submissive to your masters, and with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but to those who are unreasonable. A lot of you biblically oriented people remember that some of those kinds of verses in the Bible. These policies favor low regulation and minimal workers' rights may exacerbate existing wealth inequalities. But wealth inequity is a feature of the system in their mind, not a bug. The way inequality works is, on one hand, it creates concentrations of wealth whose beneficiaries are determined to manipulate the political process to hold on and enhance their privileges, the elite. And on the other hand, it generates a sense of instability and anxiety among broad sector of the wider public which is then ripe for converse, conversion to a religion that promises authority and order. Yeah. I've read a lot of words here, but what they're saying is the peons, the average people, have to go to church to get comfort from the terrible society they live in. Yeah. And the elites control everything and have all the money. Uh, that drives church membership, isn't it? Isn't it a great strategy? Yeah. And then they get to decide who they help. And they, oh, of course, they get to decide who they help. Oh. And the, the assumption I'm, I'm editorializing here, if you're not going to church, you're not getting any benefits. You're not getting, you get welfare for the church, you gotta show up and be there. You know, it's not like going to the county office and getting welfare benefits. And the other, the other thing, I was gonna, I'm gonna the next slide. One of the founders is Paul Weirich back in the 1980s. Uh, and he, what he said is, and he started, Christian, one of the starters of Christian nationalism, I don't want everybody to vote. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting population goes down. And this is why we had gerrymandering for years before Paul Weirich, but we're seeing it emphasized today, voter roll reduction happening all over and other dirty tricks to disenfranchise voters. So that's a rush through of, of how crazy this movement is. I'm not saying that all these people believe all this, but these are the kinds of people that are driving this movement and we could very well see some of these effect to come into more effect as they become more powerful in our society. Next thing I thought I would do. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read all this, this is too much, but if, if, so this is some of the groups involved in Christian nationalism. Um, does anybody, I, I underlined a couple that I think are interesting. Does anybody see names up there you recognize? I mean, the Family Research Council is really famous. People of the American way you hear about. Heritage, Heritage Foundation. Foundation. I like the concerned women for America. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> you can keep your effing concerns. Right yeah, right. <laughs> and some more. The more majority is gone. Yeah. I'm going to point this one out. I have a, I'm involved, was involved with these people. The Institute for Religion and Democracy, none of you ever heard of them, but I'll tell you a story about them later. Alliance Defending Freedom. Who's, who's an ex-employee of Alliance Defending Freedom? Our Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is a hot lawyer who fought civil liberties and civil rights issues as a lawyer for that group. They have around 400 lawyers. It's on the order of an ACLU in size. A Federalist Society we know. And I, I'm, uh, and the other groups involved, and this is getting a little bit tangential, but 
they, they, she mentioned two or three charter schools, but of course there's many charter schools involved. The Catholic Church directives are involved in this to some extent. Um, she says the Conscience and Religious Freedom Division of the Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights is somewhat involved in the Christian Nationalist Movement. I couldn't tell you more about that, but anyway. National Organization for Marriage, Family Watch International. So there's, there's a, and I put that up here to say, this ain't your two or three people, this isn't like the Republican Party in a one set. There's many people involved in many aspects of this movement. Um, other groups that she didn't mention, I have some friends that are interested in this, and they tell me, oh, you, she, missed, she missed a major group. One of the groups they met, she missed was the New Apostolic Reformation. And my, my buddy is an ex-Marine, and he's, he's a gun carrier, and he's a, he's a left winger, but he's, he's on both sides. You know, he, uh, he campaigns. He's a dire Republican who's a leading solicitor for Susan Wilde's campaign every year. He's, he's, she, he is her probably top door-to-door -to -door person, runs Allentown canvassing. But the new apostolic reformation is guns and militia kind of group. And they have the seven mountain mandate that holds there are seven aspects of society that believers seek to influence. Family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. And they call this Christian uh, dominionism. Other, other militias that she doesn't mention in her book, Proud Boys we know from the January 6th, the Three Percenters, which is not a group, but Three Percenters say that in the revolution, only 3% of Americans fought the British in the revolution, and that's how we won. There's no evidence that that's true, but nonetheless. Um, Society for Civic, American Civic Renewal, and there, there's many other groups that are also involved in, in all this jazz, too. Um, so what, what's the background? Who is funding Christian nationalism? Yeah, who is? Christian nationalism is gigantic, over a billion dollars in funding. There are a lot of wealthy organizations and people funding this, and that's why it's such a big and, and pervasive movement. The Alliance Defending Freedom, her book says, has a $100 million budget. Well, they have, as I say, 400, 397 lawyers, and they put out a lot of hate, and, and they're involved in a lot of these lawsuits around the LGBT people, as a matter of fact. Uh, the First Liberty Institute's involved, the Beckett Fund, um, the Servant Foundation. The other people that did this TV ad at the Super Bowl, did you see the yes. TV ad, what said, yes. Jesus gets us or something? Yeah. I didn't really yeah. see it, but. Um, and, and, and so this is a very, very wealthy operation, and it's driven by rich people, I think, and, and rich organizations. Are we doing all right here? Yeah. <laughs> um, what do Christian nationalists do? Her book says a lot about this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want you to understand what they're doing here. Um, it's illegal for a church to say vote for Donald Trump or, or uh, Joe Biden. It's illegal. And you can lose your tax exempt status. The IRS never prosecutes that. Um, and some churches apparently do that. Um, many don't, but what they do is they put out voter guides that say, vote your biblical values, vote your uh, right to life candidates, and it's a pretty veiled threat as to what uh, they're talking about there. Um, and I'll tell you more about voter guides from Ralph Reed, oh, here, right here. You remember Ralph Reed? He was a real activist here 20 years ago, and he's still floating around. You don't hear his name as much. But he's a political activist and has, has done a lot of things. He says a couple years ago, five years ago, that they put out 35 million nonpartisan voter guides, and they put them out to churches for churches to distribute. Um, 117,000 churches and houses of worship. They make 15 million phone calls, 20 million emails and texts, 7 million voters in battleground states. Is he telling the truth? I don't know. I mean, it's a big number, and this isn't a ballpark. What they do is they have set up a, uh, a system uh, where they categorize people. Um, uh, I'm ahead of my notes here, but I'll try it by memory. They have a file of maybe 150 million voters, and they can't get data on the people. If they own a pickup truck, if they go to church regularly, and all those kind of things, and they can categorize and say, this 10% are likely to be our best voters. 
Then they get after them and call them and make sure they vote, make sure they're registered to vote, and they focus on the, that high, high likelihood of, of voters who would vote for their causes. Uh, and that's how they, one of the ways they uh, drive their uh, getting out the vote. They have a website called Champion the Vote, and that um, you can actually go down and see, and it gives a lot of information about uh, what, uh, what you should be doing to vote. Um, they also have luncheons, and they get pastors from conservative churches together for lunch on a Tuesday or something. Nice lunch and speakers and all that kind of stuff. And they say to them, you can't promote political candidates in church. It's illegal. And the IRS isn't suing anybody over it. They should be, but they're not. Um, but what you can do is tell us who in your church is socially active. Get three or four members of the church, and we'll form a committee, and we'll tell them what to do. Now, you can't tell them what to do. You, you tell us who the activists are. We'll form a, a religious, uh, I forgot to have a name for them, but some, you know, liberty committee or something. And we'll tell them how to canvass the members of the congregation, how to get people out to vote. Because Congress, I mean, in this group here, I, let's say, I'm, I was, or, Trish was the president. She can't say vote for Trump or vote for, well, we're not a church either, but we were a church. But you can do anything you want. You can sit together and have meetings and do contact your parishioners and other peers and promote uh, voting for any particular candidate. That's not illegal. So that is one of the ca uh, tactics they do. And the other thing that Ralph Reed says is it only matters who turns out. It doesn't matter how many registered voters you have and how many align with you. It's who actually shows up. So let me tell you a little bit more about what these people do. So back in 2004, um, school choice pi uh, pioneers, who I don't remember if you're ever hearing about, May and Martin Duger were honored at a, an event hosted by the Heritage Foundation. This is a big uh, political think tank in Washington, D.C., aligned with the Republicans. Their underlying motive for the voucher programs is not to improve education, but to eliminate non-sectarian education. In other words, they want voucher programs to stop sectarian training that happens in public schools. And May Duggan, this is pretty close to home here, May Duggan once said, we don't want teaching humanism. Humanism is, is the basis of the public schools. Now, you, we all don't know that, do we? Maybe by implication, because we're not allowed to teach religion in public schools other than history. Um, but in other words, this goes way back. But I'm telling you, there's a threat to humanism in this. If we have a big Christian nationalist government, we could find a lot more pressure on humanists and atheists, I'm afraid. And the other thing is, the abortion issue has never just been about abortion. No. It's been about dividing and uniting to mobilize votes for the sake of massing uh, political power. Jim, yeah. I'm in education, and I can tell you the details on that top line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Thank you. I was a school teacher in New York State for 33 years, and I've been following all this politics and vouchers, in case anybody doesn't know, is a big fat lie, because it's never enough money to buy your tuition at a school, but it is enough money to add to what you would pay, maybe it's half what you need, and then you're taking taxpayer, your local school taxes, and you're putting in the pocket of a church. Because you, what you do is you, you, you take whatever that voucher will give you, depending on the locality, that came out of your pocket as a, as a regular school tax that you thought was going to the public schools, but the voucher redistributes it to the church. So just in case somebody didn't know that, and that's what charter schools are. And charter schools, they have shareholders. And again, charter schools, if they're allowed to, will and have taken your taxpayer dollar that was supposed to go to your public school, and now they've put it in the charter school, which by the way, the teachers aren't certified, and they're not covered by rules, so they can totally abuse those teachers, and they're not as good, because they're not certified. Um, and all of their statistics are horrible on charter schools, in case you didn't know. Yeah, and they can still throw out kids, ESL, special needs, they just throw them out. They end up back in the public school where I was. But, um, but the voucher and the charter is about taking your education money out of your pocket in taxes, putting it in the pocket of a church. 
So in case you didn't know about vouchers, that's what it is. It's taking your money. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, go ahead. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. the uh, champion, the vote.com uh, no longer exists. You can buy it if you want, but it's no oh, longer well, active. It a month ago. It was, it, it's not, a, it's, $2,840 and it's yours. Oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm, we're swapping out. We're swapping out microphones. Okay, oh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. So let me explain a little bit more about this business about abortion. Roe versus Wade was overturned and was uh, established in 1973. And I think I'm pretty sure in the writing here she said that the Baptist church said it was a good thing uh, to prevent unwanted children or whatever. And for six years, it wasn't a big issue. In about 1979, people like Paul Ryberg and the others were sitting there saying, how can we get people focused on our issue of, of making schools uh, religious and stopping integration of schools without, because no one's going to vote in the North is going to vote to have uh, private schools with no black people. We just, you know, maybe then we might have, but we're not that interested in that today particularly. But they said is the abortion issue we can use to drive the private, uh, maintain our private schools. You know, I'm, not, I'm not making myself too clear. So in 1973, the Roe versus Wade has passed for six years. There's no energy around this issue. In 79, they decided we're going to make abortion the big issue, but the real issue is keeping our schools uh, uh, segregated and also religiously oriented. So in 79, they, they cast on this issue of uh, abortion as being a, 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 you know, a thing that they really wanted to promote. Um, so, I, so next thing I want to tell you about, I have a story about one of these groups. So my story about fighting the Institute for Religion and Democracy, um, I was a Methodist for many years, I was a Lutheran a little bit, and I was a lay leader of a Methodist church, and I, I, they asked me to teach Bible study 25, 30 years ago, and I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I knew 30 years ago I'm just not going to teach the Bible, that's ridiculous. But I realized in the 90s that the LGBT rights battle was really a valuable battle and it really should have, it shouldn't be a battle, it should, we should be welcoming everybody. So I read books, went to conferences, heard speakers, gave Sunday school classes around, uh, adult Sunday school classes around books I'd read. Um, and in 2000 I went to Cleveland for the general meeting of the, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. This is where 5,000 Methodists meet for 10 days and, and there's no bishop that runs the church, there's no pope or anything. These thousand delegates make all the decisions. So you present ideas and they process them through committees and then finally vote, thousand people voting all this stuff. And while I was there, I hooked up with a group called Soul Force and we got arrested for blocking access to the convention center that the Methodist Church was meeting in. There were 190 of us that were arrested. The general conference started at eight in the morning. There was nobody in sight at 9 a.m. and we blocked access. The building probably had 24 doors and two driveways. We blocked one driveway. So it was a meaningless uh, physically blocking access, but it was, it was made the national news and that kind of stuff. What were, what were you, we were, which is what were you, you were blocking it for? What? Symbolizing that we don't agree with the Methodist Church's stand. This well, church, and by the way, the story ended this week. This week, the Methodist Church will now ordain gay pastors, out gay pastors. The church has been ordaining gay pastors for years, but they've been hidden, and, you know, and, and they've defrocked 20 or 30 of them. Uh, I was at a trial of a lady in, uh, named Beth Stroud down in uh, Germantown United Methodist Church, and the trial was held in a camp near there. And uh, she was a lesbian, married to another woman, well, not married, partnership. They decided to have a child, artificial insemination, and she said, once your child was born, she said, I am not lying to my child about who I am and who I love. I'm just not doing that. She was the associate pastor of First United Methodist Church of Germantown, so she wrote a letter to the bishop saying, I'm a lesbian, and they tried her and threw her out of the church. She was actually defrocked, but there were probably 30 or 40 defrocked over that time. So I go to General Conference 2000, and it's like knife fighting without blood. I mean, this isn't, they, the bishops are talking about, oh, we're going to have holy, let's have a moment for prayer, holy conferencing, and they're maneuvering. I mean, some votes, some issues come up, we're getting ready to discuss, they move to in discussion and go to the vote, and they had already planned people to vote for that. So we, some issues we want to discuss, they wouldn't even allow discussing. There was a lot of dirty tricks and sneaky stuff going on. 
Uh, and uh, we got about 35% of the vote to ordain gay people at that point, and, and, and about five other issues. But um, in 2004, I was at General Conference in Pittsburgh. In 2008, I was in General Conference in, Pittsburgh, in uh, Fort Worth. And after three 10-day battles and you know, eight years between them, I thought, this, this is sick. I mean, this isn't a church. This is a political institution that is doing political tricks to undermine the will of the people and, and, and to preserve prejudice. And I said, I can't go anymore. I just, I'm still involved with the, I'm in, uh, on the board of affirmation, the gay group, group in the church that fights some of these battles. But I don't go to general conference anymore. I'm just the treasurer. And so in her book, she talks about this group. This is the group that fought us in the Methodist Church, Institute for Religion and Democracy. They look like CIA agents, you know, great looking suits, I mean, limousines maybe, and big hotel rooms, and we're sitting, we're camping out, and we're living in, you know, Motel 6 is kind of a deal. Um, and let's see if I can find the quote in here. A, a couple of authors wrote a book in 2007 called Steeplejacking, how the Christian right is hijacking mainstream religion. And it says that this IRD group used covert methods to wage war on, on mainline churches like the United Methodist, the Presbyterian Church, and the United Church of Christ. And to quote uh, the book here, in alliance with fundamentalist and evangelical Christians, IRD uses trained activists, skillfully developed clandestine tactics to infiltrate and hijack churches in order to force out liberal leadership and replace it with those who share their conservative worldview. And they pick same-sex marriage as the wedge issue. They said, we're going to fight these gay people because you know, most religious people don't want to support gay people, right? Um, the authors go on to say, unfortunately, the authors report, the response to that attack on the Methodist Church was anemic. There was an awareness that something nefarious was going on, they write, but the cost of confronting the bullies was more than the leadership was willing to pay. I saw it, and I left the Methodist Church over it. After three big 10-day battles, I said, this is sick. The church is just sick. You know. Anyway, so um, that, that is my story on religion... Uh, Institute for Religion and Democracy. And they were always better financed than we were, too, of course. Um, but anyway, my, my whole point is that her book vindicates my decision based on that, uh, that issue. I guess I already read this to you, yeah. So, ahead of myself. And I can't tell you much about Project Blitz, but Project Blitz is the uh, playbook for the nationwide assault on state legislatures in 50 states. They've funded think tanks to develop legislation, and they run it up to states wherever they can, and where it's successful, they <laughs> duplicate it. Where it's weak, they re-edit it and move it around. So you see states, uh, maybe more uh, southern, more conservative states, having bills that are very similar because this Project Blitz is communicating uh, that strategy. It's another one of the things that they do. I don't want to go too much detail on that. Um, another theory they have is that they believe that 10% of the people in any country in the world can change that country if they have the right strategies, persevere, and if they will just find a way to put their differences in society and come together. <laughs> yeah, 10% is what, this is, what this is their strategy, I, I guess I would say. What else do Christian nationals do? I'll wrap this up now, but, um, oh, this is the business about having files. It's actually on 200 million voters and, and the, almost the entire voting population so they can figure out who is likely to be a voter that's favorable to them and then make sure they have people trying to get them out to the polls. Um, <clears throat> so enough bad news, right? What can we do about it, right? The whole idea of the new initiatives, what can we do to fight Christian nationalism? I'm not leaping up and down about our opportunities, but let's, let's talk about it anyway. So the first thing is Rob Reiner made a movie from Power Worshippers, a book called God and Country. And Jeff and his wife saw it. I saw it. Who else? Someone else. Yeah. I didn't go, but I saw it. <laughs> did you, oh, did you see it? How, online, did you see it? Yeah, I just uh, watched it on Prime Video. You can stream it now. Okay. Online, you, okay. But... All right. So um, I think it's well done. You know, it, it's several like what I'm talking about here. I'm talking a little more detail here, a little more content, where this thing is like a fire engine of information. But it's a lot of interviews of the people running Christian National, what they say and what, the, what they're thinking about. Um, I, I didn't say this earlier, but some people say, well, we're not, we're not fighting, fighting Christians here. 
We're fighting Christian nationalism, which isn't really Christian teaching. But Aunt Annie Laurie Gaylor, the co-president of Freedom From Religion Foundation, reviewed the movie, and she says, it's true we're not fighting Christians, but if it fails to acknowledge any role that Christianity and the Bible have contributed to ginning up all the anger and fear of, in Christian nationalists. It's important to note that not, not all is sweetness and light in the history of Christianity and biblical dictates. The Bible is a behavioral grab bag, yet some Christian nationalists insist, insist the answer is to go back to the scriptures. So she's saying, okay, we don't want to have a fight with Christianity, but if they win, we're going to be stuck with a lot of Christian crap that we, we don't agree with. So let's see here. What have I got to do? What's, okay, what can we do to, about Christian nationalism we're talking about? Well, register to vote. I mean, and we did a get out the vote here a few years ago, and everybody among the humanists says, register to vote. Make sure you vote in every election. Almost all of us are doing that already. Help get out the vote if you can get involved with voter drive and that kind of stuff. And I'd say if you've got some money you want to invest in this effort, here are four organizations, and I have a handout that's got their names on them. The Americans United for Separation of Church and State, AU.org, is a really good organization, and they have a lot of good information. Freedom from Religion Foundation has a big program. American Atheists has a big program. American Humanists, which you know, I'm on the board of American Humanists, uh, so I can't, I should, I'm, you know, but they are involved, but they're not quite as powerful as the other three. And Mary Dale and I, and a, uh, are involved with the Secular Coalition for America, which is a lobbying group, and we go down to lobby. I wouldn't say they, they're not in the main battle. They're trying to organize the 20 progressive organizations in their lobbying to fight Christian nationalism and other things. That is that piece. I'd like to suggest you challenge Christian nationalist statements even in your family. When you come across them in your family, this is going to take some work on your part. You're going to have to think, of, what do I think about these issues? But I think we need to, even in your families, when, uh, when you think it's a good time to discuss these things, um, I challenge Christian nationalism in your family. Um, you could read the book. I have covered the vast majority of the content of the book. And there are other books that I have on a handout that I'll give you, too, that you could read. But if you want to read more about this, um, that is in the book, but I've given you a vast majority of what's in there. Remain in dialogue with Christian nationalist people you know. I, I've got a, I have a men's group that meets every Tuesday for breakfast, and we have a, uh, a person come who would be aligned on the other side of me politically. And my friend insulted him about six months ago <laughs> in a big battle. And then I had to admit that I insulted him about three months ago, <laughs> so he hasn't come back. So I'm failing at that. But he's saying that this guy was telling me that the... Uh, uh, the election was, wasn't, was stolen. He, he, so he's convinced the election is stolen, and I, I said, I, I just can't have a conversation with you. Anyway, see the documentary. A few of us have seen it. Look for God and Country. It's on, on streaming. It's available. Did you like it, or did you think it was interesting? Or, yeah? Um, or am I putting you on the spot? You no, want, oh. I, a lot of the information wasn't new for me, but oh. I do agree that it doesn't address... It doesn't address the... The evangelicals that they featured in the film that were criticizing Christian nationalism say the same types of things. We need to go back to the true teachings of Jesus. We need to go back to what the Bible says. Yeah. But that's what Christian nationalists say as well. I don't know what the true teaching is. There's never been this pure, yeah. you approach the Bible with your own, you interpret it the way that you want to interpret it. You approach it with your own biases, your own values, is what you're going to get out of it, is what you put into it. Yeah. And I just don't think that the film really addressed that. Yeah. And what you're saying, she's saying is that some evangelicals aren't in this ilk. They're evangelical, but they're not part of this. Mm -hmm. Others are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a 90-minute webinar in my handout if you want to see. It's not that good, but you see, the, you see the author of the book and Rob Reiner, no, he wasn't actually involved, but his uh, producers were involved in that. And there's a two-minute trailer, which is not that interesting, but give you an idea of uh, writing the web, what's involved. No, oh, no. <laughs> All right, so we're going to wing it from here. The rest is on my hands now. I'm not going to wing it. I, I'm the one that likes to have scripts, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, 
And, and I would think, you know, I encourage you all to study this some more. Some of you have and some of you still need to work on it, but get some ideas together what you would say if you come across a Christian nationalist. We're going to have to fight this battle in, in our communities. I've got a good, happy story. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm from Bucks County. I don't know if you guys have heard that we threw them out of our school board. Yes. Okay, and, and so, and, and you know, you can go online and watch school board meetings and, the, and a lot of the curmudgeons that get in there and start saying, oh, I hate gay kids and which bathroom are they going to use, they're coming from this, right? So there's a really great way you can shout them down at your school board meeting. If that's happening, you can, you can get your three minutes and shout them down. That's a really effective, because that's where they're, they know that by law they're allowed to have their three minutes, so they're targeting school board meetings. It's a little funny, you know, hairline way in. But we went door to door, and uh, $8 million campaigns to take over, the, to, to take over Bucks school. County, and then we went door to door and threw them out, and they're all gone. So it can, it can be done, we just did it. So the, the, the you know, parents, the, the local, just parents that were involved just made up their own organization out of, you know, real groundswell. And then they just went door to door and said, do you understand who these idiots are? And everyone went, oh no, I didn't know. People don't know. Because they've got these TV ads they look like national politics for a school board election. It shouldn't be allowed, but these hedge funds get involved. That's, a, that's something you missed in there. Is there's a lot of hedge funds that back all this shit because yeah. it gives them power. It gives them inroads to political power. So if the hedge fund guys and deregulation, if they can get into the religious, then they've got access. Now they're talking to the politician and they can deregulate hedge funds. So there's a lot of hedge fund money in there, but but there's our good news in Bucks County. So, and the other thing I think we could do is uh, try and grow Lehigh Valley Humanists because we have a good community here. We've got a lot of good ideas and a lot of good energy. And I think we ought to attract more people to our movement and, and uh, make this thing better in our own community. So I have a handout that summarizes the action items and some books and ideas if you'd like, anybody wants one. If you, if you wants to slog through the script, I've got a script that I'd be glad to email you. Um, any other comments or questions? Or uh, There's a book. It's called The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. It's written by a Christian. But in there, he went around the country, and he went to, they become mega churches because people are sucked into those yeah. Christian nationalism. Um, he went to those and, and asked questions of the pastor. And, stuff. and then he went to other churches that follow the teachings of Jesus, and they have a different view of, they'd be more, um, they're not literal about the Bible. They... <laughs> use yeah. their heads. Anyway, but um, anyway, interesting book, yeah. and it delineates out the differences if anybody's interested. Yeah, and I have it on my reading list here. <laughs> it's a, there are three copies in the Lehigh Carbon uh, library system you can get for free if you're connected to a Lehigh Carbon uh, uh, thing. Any other, well, I, any other questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know how useful it is, but I did want to point out like um, the end of the slide, the next to last slide there, bullet points five and seven, I thought were really good. Uh, and as far as making a difference, one of the things I, I found personally I can do that I'm tempted to be lazy often and not do is to push back and sort of um, disarm religious types of their fear. You can't really like take their fear away, but I think that's um, a big driving motivator. And once you're not so scared, it maybe seems a little bit more silly. Good, thanks. Well, I think that wraps me up here about 11.55 or maybe we run a little bit long. It's just basically fascism. It's just, it's just fascism. It's, it's yeah. wrapped up in Christianity and that's how the Nazis started. In fact, yeah. Nazis, the, the, it's like Christian national is in there in the Nazi the same party. So it's exactly the same. But, I, yeah. and, but this is all about people wealthy people manipulating through religion so that they can have power uh, and control yeah. everything. But that's the only thing it is. And I don't know why um, that's so hard. All right, thank you. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here unless anybody has any other questions. Again, if you, oh, go ahead. Um, 
What do you got? One? <laughs> She's got her own microphone here. Um, I just want to mention in, in relation to, to voting, uh, I, uh, I know Butch and I both work for the polls, maybe some, some others do as well, but I think that's another important way to, to really get out there and support the whole election process because there are some real crazies that work these polls. <laughs> and <laughs> you have to, you know, we need reasonable people mm -hmm. who can just do the job and not alienate people when they're coming in to, to cast yeah. their vote. <clears throat> yeah. All right, thank you. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here then. Is this interesting or was this anxiety producing or what? <laughs> All right, so you, you got a quick dose of Christian nationalism. I know a lot of you are reading here, I know.